The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, by your bountiful goodness, release us from the bonds of our sins, which by reason of our weakness we have brought upon ourselves, that we may stand firm until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome now to this second to last Sunday of the church year, uh, proper 28, in which we will be looking at the Hebrews text again. It's the last one in the lectionary uh, for series B, at least. We only have one Sunday left, of course. Um, and we have had a number of texts that have have uh, been part of the, the, the um, epistle to the Hebrews and that what I call a homily to the congregation that is in this malaise that is, is suffering and that is looking maybe for a more severe persecution in the future but is so far just holding off because uh, it has not yet come to the point of shedding blood. Uh, as, as you know, during this part of the church year, we are focusing on judgment. Uh, the gospel lesson for today, is, this day, is Mark 13, 1 to 13, which is um, the, the eschatological discourse in Mark by Jesus concerning the, the end of the, the world, the end of, of the, the last days. And the last verse of our text is, He who endures to the end will be saved. And in a way, what Hebrews does is help us understand what does it mean to endure till the end until we are saved. Now, now this is a very interesting breakdown in a pericope, and I honestly don't remember the reason why we chose this. Maybe we inherited it from um, the original three-year lectionary, um, although we have made some revisions. This, this text is, is part of two different um, parts of, of, of Hebrews 10. Um, in, in the Kleinig commentary on Hebrews, um, the first section, 11 to 18, is entitled by him, and it, this is actually 1 to 18, so this is the end of that text, perfect access to God. And then 19 to 25 stands on its own, and he calls it the open way. Now, they're obviously related, but there, there, is a, there is a break there after, after 18, and, and in the Van Oya sort of construction of this, he starts with verse 19 as the final exhortation. Um, when I studied Hebrews back at the seminary with Dr. Harold Bulls, some of you who are listening to this might remember him very well, um, he considered 11 to 18 the climax of Hebrews. Um, I actually don't know what Kleinig considers. I know Van Oya considers it 9-11 and following as being the climax. It's kind of at a, a chiastic moment, and it's right at the tip here of the chiasm. But <clears throat> Lenski also considers this the, the climax of Hebrew. So it's obviously a very important part. And you, you'll see the movement is from the, the, the high priests of the Old Testament to the, the high priest now who is Jesus himself. So let's, let's turn our attention here to the text and just look it over a little bit. Um, <clears throat> you, you can see here that we have a, a, a very rich text filled with all kinds of, of loaded theological language. I mean, for one, this is in per perpetuity, this language here, you know, without interruption is, I think, how Kleinig refers to it. It's obviously a, a very important little, you know, kind of refrain we see over and over again. Um, <clears throat> we also have the, 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 the language here that comes from this beautiful text in, um, in Jeremiah. And it, it's, it's quite a remarkable text that is cited over and over and over again. And the, the New Covenant you know, that I will cut with them. This is obviously a covenant that has strong Eucharistic overtones. And if this is the climax of Hebrews, then it is a Eucharistic climax. Um, 
here's the language of forgiveness, where there is forgiveness of things. There is no longer the need for a sacrifice on behalf of sin, an offering, I should say, on behalf of sin. So, I mean, you, you have a, a section here. If this is the climax, it's a very, very theologically dense and rich section. And then in, in the second part here, um, you have, have the language of Jesus by his blood entering into the holy place, you know, and, and this to me is one of the most important parts of this, through his flesh, you know, that's the passing through the curtains that is through his flesh. Um, and and that, that obviously I think has both a, a relationship to the atonement, but also to the Eucharist. And remember, these are essentially two, sign, two sides of the same coin. And the way in which we participate in the atonement today is through the Eucharist. And even though there are some, like Craig Kester, who don't think Hebrews talks about the Eucharist, I know both Kleinig and I see it as being a, a deeply Eucharistic text. Um, and then, then you've got this, this great language here at the end that has kind of just the, 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 the sound of, of even Paul. And here, you know, you've got the triad, hope, faith, and love. That keeps coming up all over the place, not just in Paul. And um, the language here is just so beautiful. And it's it really, uh, you know, I mean, a wonderful way to bring the church here to a close. So let's, let's go back and look at some of the specifics here and, and just kind of get a sense of the language and how we might preach on it. Um, he starts in verse 11 here, and if this is, as I said, the beginning of a, of a climax, it, it, it really does have a ring of, of, of a climactic character to it. Now, on the one hand, he says, every priest stands, and I put this in purple because this is a reference to the Old Testament, stands every day as one who is liturgizing. That's, that's, that's the, the uh, I think that's the, um, the uh, yeah, that's the Kleinig interpretation. Liturgizing and frequently offering, you know, sacrifices, which is not able, which is never able to completely remove sins. Now, here you have the beginning of that contrast. Here's the Old Testament and the Old Testament priesthood. Now, we've been setting up for this all through Hebrews, and that's why, in a way, this is uh, climactic. But on the other hand, this, and in parentheses, we want to say this priest, this high priest, Christ, reference to Christ here, having offered a single, look at how he does this, a single sacrifice on behalf of sins. There's the offering, on behalf of sins. Huper, substitutionary language. And as I said, the Kleining translation, you know, Without interruption, I always translated it in perpetuity, but without interruption, what does he do after he has done this? He sits on the right hand of God. Now, here you have the humiliation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection, exaltation. Now, I mean, you, you have a dogmatics textbook right here, and it's, it's really quite brilliant. I mean, it's, it's just beautiful to see how he, he develops this. And then in 13, you have, a, again, another hint at kind of the now, not yet, this inaugurated eschatology, where in verse 13, he says this, waiting from then on until his enemies, until his enemies um, have been placed as a footstool under his feet. So while we are waiting, okay, for that final parousia, okay, we are experiencing all the benefits 
of the crucifixion and resurrection at the Eucharist, you know, in the divine service. And then in verse 14, he says, and he, he now kind of, let's erase some of this. He now does a, a frame here where he shows us the one here and the one. For, he says, and, th and this is in verse 14, for by a single offering, he, without interruption, this beautiful frame here, without interruption, has made perfect, the verb, those who are hagiazomenus, th those who are being made holy. And again, I mean, you, you cannot help but see this as the atonement and the Holy Eucharist. And that really, the, the, the notion of sacrificial language in the Eucharist because of its relation to the atonement just cannot be denied. It's, it, in many ways, it's just dripping with it here in this text. Now, this is what gives him the, the reason to now come to this passage from Jeremiah 31 that is so important to the Hebrews' argument. And in many ways, what I think we, uh, maybe I should just go back a little bit. Oops, hold on. What, oops. Yeah, I think if I do that, that's good. Okay, what, what I think we want to see here is that this is a midrash, an interpretation of verse 14 here, you know, where it says, for by one sacrifice being offered, he has brought to completion without, interrupt without interruption for a perpetuity those who are being sanctified. And, and here in verse 15, he, he shows that it, it's, it's the Holy Spirit bearing witness to us. And what does he bear witness to us? Um, for after saying, this covenant that I will make for them after these days... Now, after these days is a reference to the eschatological days when the Messiah is coming, says the Lord. Um, I will put my law in their hearts and on their minds. I will write them. And what is, what, what, how does it end here? He also says, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no long. You know, and, and this is, of course, leads into the forgiveness of sins. Now, where does this happen? Where does this happen? And I think you can see here that, you know, if this one sacrifice obviously refers to the cross, this is where, and we've always used Jeremiah 31 as a reference to the, the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. This is a clear reference to the Lord's Supper. And the final, final word here there is then, where there is remission from these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Because that offering for sin, that once and for all sacrifice, which Hebrews, you know, hits again and again and again, that, that you know, once and for all, he has died on the cross. But that, the, 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 the body and blood of that sacrifice is now offered to us here at the Lord's Supper. And how crucial that is for understanding how it is that we are to understand the, the Eucharist. Now, this brings us to the second part of this text, the open way. And I think you can see how one is going to lead into the other. Um, <clears throat> he, he sort of changes gears here, and you can see there is a, a, a bit of a, a, a break here in the action. Um, and, and this whole section here, I think, really does have to do with liturgia and diaconia. And you're going to see, I think because of the page break here, it's not going to come out. But there is a break at 23. So really, in a way, 19 to 22 has to do with the liturgia. 
19 to 22. Can we get all that on there? Just about. 1922 has to do with the liturgia, not quite. And then 23 to 25 has to do with diaconia. And you've heard this perhaps from me before, but for my money, liturgia and diaconia, what we receive at the divine service and then the liturgy of life that we bear in bearing Christ to the world, you know, that really is sanctification. These two things together, Christ in the divine service and Christ embodied in life, daily life, this is the gospel. It's both. You have to have both the reception of the gifts and the embodiment of the gifts in the liturgy, <clears throat> uh, the liturgy of life. So let's just look at the text here a little bit. This first part is just sublime, as, as you know. Therefore, brothers, and I love this. He, th this is a, a kind of a curiosity. Parousia means confidence, you know, but Kleine continually translates it as freedom of speech, having freedom of speech, which I guess is a confidence, to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, okay, which he inaugurated for us, the way, okay, a new and living way, new and living, through the curtain, that is, the way of his flesh, okay. Now, again, we, how can you not see both the atonement and the Lord's Supper here. You know, we have confidence now to enter into holy things through the blood of Jesus, this new and living way, you know, which has gone before us, that is his flesh. Now, he's obviously talking about what happens on the holy of holies of the cross, but also in our own holy of holies. So we're, we're still, we still have a, a sentence going here. So let's move this down. Sadly, this thing doesn't all fit together, but that's okay. So through his flesh. And, and then look, look what he does here uh, in verse 21. Um, he says, And having a great priest over the house of God. Now here's your verb. And this is, brings to the end the part about the liturgy. Let us come near with a true heart, in the fullness of faith. And here, here you can hear baptismal language. Um, having had our hearts sprinkled from a, an evil conscience, and having had our body washed with pure water. Now, what are we drawing near to? We're drawing near to the Holy of Holies for us, which is the altar where one has the body and blood of Christ. Okay, now, as I said, these first verses, what is it, 19 to 22 is liturgia. Okay, how it is that we receive the gifts and enter in through his flesh, you know, with our great high priest, you know, to, to, to have this, this, this apprehension by faith, having been cleansed by holy baptism. Okay, second part of the text. Can we get it all? Oh, yeah, piece of cake. This, this would be now 23, 24, and 25. Um, and you can, you can see there's a, a little switch here in the, in, in the accent. Let us then hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Ah, cline, without wavering. For he who promised, the one who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another. Now, these go together, these two. This is, you know. So he's saying, let's, let's, let's hold fast now to the hope that we have and participate here in the liturgia. 
And now he's going to make the move to diaconia. And let us consider one another in order to provoke, provoke, it's almost a violent word, love and kalon, these are noble works. The, the works that come from, from the, the, the reception of Christ in the holy places. Not forsaking the communal assembly, the epi synagogain, you know, the ones who gather together, just as it says is a habit of some to neglect it. And you can see there's those who have suffered from the malaise and have stopped meeting together soon with the community, but encouraging one another, giving one parakaleo. And then the last line, and all the more so you see the day approaching. All the more as you see the, the day that is coming, you know, and the, this, these are the eschatological days. And obviously, th this, this is the, the day of parousia, but it could also be the day of martyrdom. Martyr, martyrdom. Well, I'm not spelling well on the board here, but martyrdom, where they were going to maybe be, be persecuted even to the point of death. Now, what, what I'm suggesting here is with these two hortatory subjunctives, and especially the, the exhortation to love and good works, you know, the meeting together in the assembly, pushing you back into the, de, the divine service so that you can, you can, you know, be prepared to embody love and good works in the world. And, and the day is drawing near where the, the, the accounting will be there, the, the judgment will be there. Now, what a way to end on this second to last Sunday of the church year with the, the fact that the day is drawing near. And, you know, as the days are getting darker around us, as we see, you know, nature dying, as the sun is getting uh, smaller and smaller day by day in terms of its appearance, as, as we can feel the cold and the damp here in Indiana kind of creeping in on us, um, we have a sense of that judgment that is coming. And we're about to, to celebrate the end of the church year and the beginning of our expectations of celebrating the incarnation with Christmas. We realize how important it is to, to understand the need to encourage one another and to gather together in the divine service so that we might be strengthened to face the malaise of a world in darkness. And at this time of year, it's so clear that, you know, as Jesus looks out over the city of Jerusalem and the temple and he talks about its end, we know the end is coming too for us. And we must be prepared. And that really is one of the calls of the church during the, the November and December seasons as we get look forward to the, the breaking in of the light at the winter solstice when Christ comes again. Um, then in the, in the end, with the light that, that is so brilliant that we will fully, fully experience the, that, that place where we will behold his flesh without sin. And so as we, we come to the end of a church year and we begin to turn our eyes towards Christmas, we thank God that we have these wonderfully rich, encouraging texts from the epistle to the Hebrews that strengthens us in our faith as we encounter that darkness and that malaise with hope, with love, and with faith.